we are now at the first review and we need progress and so we're moving from a general commitment to a specific credit uh, commitment on the on the terms uh, specific terms of the debt restructuring and so what is needed at this stage is an agreement with between the government and the OCC on those uh, on those specific terms when will those agreements be signed? We'll get uh, some answers from the finance minister. And we'll continue with our special series on the national dialysis crisis as the National Health Insurance Authority is setting up a committee to review and assess whether or not the scheme can absorb the cost of dialysis treatment after uh, Joy FM's dialysis crisis series. We have details as the Kolobu Teaching Hospital uh, and its renal unit says it is suffocating under a huge debt of some 4 million Ghana cities. Engage with government, with the ministry, with other stakeholders to see how quickly we can, you know, find the resources to advance. Because at the moment we are sitting in a 4 million uh, city hall. If we are to operate at uh, our uh, current capacity, which is about 2,000 uh, dialysis sessions every month, then it means that we are going to accumulate about 961,000 cities of debt every month. We'll tell you more about uh, the dialysis crisis, which, will, which is all coming up here on The Pulse. The Pulse is always brought to you by Global Communities, Digni Lua, for the safe sanitation. We're on DSTV Channel 421, Go TV Channel 144. I'm blessed to join you as independent, fearless and credible. We'll get details after these. And thanks for joining us this afternoon. The International Monetary Fund has revealed that China and other official creditors of Ghana are yet to reach an agreement on how they intend to restructure the external debts of the country. Ghana collectively owes external creditors some $30 billion and is seeking to restructure some $10.5 billion. However, John is now learning that the exercise is not being smooth as expected. The International Monetary Fund indicating this afternoon that the external restructuring will be crucial for the uh, country to have an approval from the IMF board, uh, which uh, will then pave way for the release of the next tranche of $600 million. Stefan Rodé is the leading uh, member of the IMF mission, heading to Ghana and assessing our situation. He has been addressing the press earlier today. On uh, uh, external... Um, on external creditors and the, the, what is needed from the IMF's perspective for us to be able to proceed with, uh, with the board meeting. Um, we mentioned it several times, we refer to it in the, press, in, the, in the press release. What is really needed at this stage is uh, uh, what we call financing assurances. The nature of those financing assurances, you will remember at the time of the pro program approval, was a general uh, commitment. Uh, from, uh, from the official creditors to provide relief consistent with the program parameters. We are now at the first review and we need progress and so we're moving from a general commitment to a specific credit uh, commitment on the, on the terms, uh, specific terms of the debt restructuring. And so what is needed at this stage is an agreement with, between the government and the OCC on those, uh, on those specific terms. For the external commercial creditors uh, based on the IMF policies, uh, what is needed, it remains the same than what was needed at the time of the program approval and it's just making sure that there is progr and progress in, in the sense that the government continues to make good faith efforts with those uh, uh, external commercial creditors to reach, um, uh, to achieve a debt restructuring agreement that will be also consistent with the program parameters. Well, so that's the position of the IMF on all of this. Uh, what's the breakdown of Ghana's level of indebtedness to external creditors? Uh, as of now, uh, we will be uh, heading over to Zoom and bringing in one individual uh, who's been watching all of that uh, for us, Isaac Kofi Aj, who will be uh, breaking down the figures and uh, giving us a sense of uh, what's happening in terms of what Ghana is seeking to do externally with our debts. Meanwhile, the finance ministry uh, has uh, provided some answers to what's happening to our external uh, debt restructuring. Ken Ferreira, the finance minister, indicating earlier today that a lot of effort is being put into this to secure an external debt restructuring. Listen. Um, um, we've had this history um, of election of uh, expenditure. Uh, but truly, if you look at um, the targets we have for the fund and the guardrails 
that we are pr trying to, to put together um, to be able to get these releases that are required because in June, I think about 300 million will have to release and then in also in December and um, next year. And then we have the World Bank DPO. Um, so those become uh, resources that we can't compromise. And so if anything at all, um, that um, would, um, would really create a necessary discipline um, to make sure that we do that. Um, and then um, we also would have um, negotiated uh, with the IPPs and also uh, with the Eurobond investors and we have the DDP program in place uh, and these are things that you cannot miss or default on. Um, I think so all of those will really restrain uh, any other expenditure that we might have you know, gotten into. You look at the Zambian experience and some are worried about the timelines here, especially with the external creditors, the bilaterals and the Eurobond as well. Looking at the timelines that you have, November ending, are you sure that you'll be able to reach this MOU and this commitment from these partners before we go to the board to get this next trend released? Um, I'm George, we have to. And um, I mean, you've seen us move from um, July 2022 to where we are, um, which a good number of people uh, were betting that it will be impossible to get to where we are today. And we are here, and I think that's a testament um, to government's commitment to make it happen. Uh, we did get the financing assurances, I had to go to China, etc. Whatever is required to do, we will do. Uh, I'm confident um, that um, um, the OCC will come through uh, in time for for the board, the executive board approval in November. How is government managing the settlement of uh, coupon rate, uh, coupon under the DDP? Um, I think the only evidence you have is what the amazing thing we did um, August 22nd, and we'll continue to fulfill that. I mean, I think the issue is, well, that there's reason uh, maybe for some skepticism, but people should begin to look at the new data uh, and honestly confront uh, what has been done and uh, with your reach to also uh, international media as to what other countries have been unable to do. Um, so we begin to talk, you know, hope and positiveness in that. Well, so we're asking that question, what's the breakdown of Ghana's level of uh, indebtedness to external creditors? Let's bring in Isaac Kofiaje, who's uh, our data analyst uh, here at uh, Joy News. Uh, Isaac, many are asking the question about uh, the breakdown. You know, how much do we owe? How much are we seeking to restructure? Well, Blessed, if you can hear me, Ghana is currently owing its external creditors uh, $30 billion. We are looking at $30 billion. And of this $30 billion, we are hoping to restructure about 34% of it, which if you estimate should be around uh, $10.5 billion. But as we speak, you know, when you're talking about external debt restructuring, it's somewhat different. It comes with some complexity compared to domestic debt restructuring. For the external debt restructuring, Ghana has to go through some three significant stages. The first stage, which will give you probably the staff level agreement and your first disbursement, we are there, which is the agreement stage. The second stage has to do uh, with the um, agreement stage, for instance. So the first stage is the assurance stage, we pass that stage. The second stage is the agreement stage, and we have the final stage, which is the actual restructuring. And you had the finance minister over there. Since, uh, you know, it's been almost a year since we defaulted on most of our external debt ob obligations. And I can say that we've not been able to progress from the first stage to the final stage. Um, you know, discussions and debt talks and negotiations have always been around the assurance stage, which was enough uh, to, to give us that first tranche, which is the 600 million. Now we are hoping to get an additional tranche of 600 million. And we have to uh, cross the first stage to actual restructuring and actual agreement, which means that we have to have different conditions and meetings with creditors like China, Pari Club, you know, multilateral loans are not part of this debt arrangement it's around 8.8 .8 billion, you know, dollars. But the most important part is the commercial creditors, the Eurobond creditors that we are owing them close to 
uh, thirteen point two billion dollars. Bless us. Uh, why is China of uh, you know? Uh of importance to, to the country. We just had the finance minister there talk about some efforts to reach out to the Chinese government. Well, China is very important because if you look at the bilateral loans that we owe, about 5.4 billion, and China is holding about, uh, you know, 43% of the entire bilateral loans. If you compare the amounts we owe China to even the Paris Club, which includes US, UK, we owe them about two billion, and China we owe China one point nine billion. So it means that China alone, as a single country, Ghana is owing them a lot. And if you look at some of the loan agreements that we have with China, for instance, most of them are collateralized loans. So in the twenty twenty two IMF reports, you can see that the IMF stated that we have about six hundred and ninety million collateralized loans, and all of them is owed to China. And events where we, we, we actually default on some of these loans, China will have access to some of our revenue sources, like our you know, mineral revenues, like uh, bauxite and, and, and you know, cocoa and other things. So that is why China is important. And you heard Joy talking about Zambia. Zambia has become a test case for almost all African countries to follow because of the way China has gone around with this Zambia situation. And so when developing countries are going into debt talks with China, they know that China doesn't forgive. They know that China will only agree to restructure when the debt is an interest-free loan. We know the case of Congo when they wanted to restructure their debts with China. China ended up, you know, increasing the maturity period and also increasing interest. So when you are talking to China about debt restructuring, you're not talking about forgiveness or debt relief. Probably they will demand for, you know, an increment in the interest or maturity period. And that is why China is very significant. Mm. And over the years, from 2000, Ghana has raked in about $5 billion, you know, project loans from China. And so it's been one major source of, you know, um, foreign liquidity as a country. And that is the reason why they are the most important piece probably in this whole negotiation process because Paris Club is watching China, yeah. Eurobank credits are watching China. They all want to see what China will do Indeed. before they make their next move. Pleasure. Well, we, we are all watching China. I mean, that's the fact of the, of the matter, uh, not knowing mm -hmm. what exactly the Chinese government will decide to do in terms of its uh, debt treatment. Um, Isaac, also joining uh, the conversation is Nicolas um, Bana. Uh, his uh, a development uh, economist also helping us to do some analysis on this. I, I just stay on uh, briefly with us. Uh, Nicolas Isaac Bana, thank you for spending uh, some time with us. So you heard from the finance minister give the assurance that the target is to meet the external debt restructuring or perhaps the uh, creditor committee agreement by the end of this year. Is that, first of all, a feasible timeline? Well, I, I, I think it's feasible. Uh, let's remember that in these matters, it's not just about the numbers. There's also a lot of diplomatic activity going on behind the scenes. Uh, in the case of Ghana, for instance, and even in Zambia, we had an intervention from French President Macron. The Americans are also actively engaged. So I think that on the basis of what has happened with Zambia, uh, the Chinese would not like to hold off for two and a half years uh, and delay the process like it happened in Zambia. So on that account, given the assessment by the IMF, also given the diplomatic activity happening behind the scenes from the Paris Club, the like of the United States, et cetera, I'm sure that it's, it's feasible. It's tight, but I'm sure with some additional work uh, and goodwill, it's feasible. Uh, what do you feel there might be a pushback um, from the investor community, uh, knowing that these are very... Um, very trying times, geopolitically speaking. Uh, you know, the West also doing its own uh, review of, of what, what might be happening to the Ghanaian economy. Then you have China being a major factor in determining the way forward. Uh, what, what do you feel might be the posture of these two different blocks in terms of how they might want to treat their debt um, to Ghana? Two things. In the case of China, if you take the case of a Zambian example, um, some of the debt was structured as commercial debt because lending from China is not coming from one institution. So you have the likes of 
the Chinese Exxon Bank, which is treated as part of the bilateral bank. But there are also other Chinese institutions that are quasi government, and their debts or lending to Zambia, for instance, were treated as part of the commercial debt, although that debt is guaranteed eventually by the Chinese government. So that, that is the nuance uh, about it also. All of China's debt is not necessarily treated uh, as bilateral. Uh, we we'll have to really get into the details and see how the negotiations work. Now, on the general bilateral creditors, as usual, the devil is always in the details. Of course, bilateral creditors admit they agree that we cannot pay back. They will definitely agree in principle that we have to restructure. But the bottom line is, as well as we have a deal quickly or there's a pushback, depends on how the negotiations work. The double of the details is always that would lead negotiations to travel. If quickly both parties, the government of Ghana and bilateral creditors, can quickly get to terms on a settlement, then we wouldn't have a long drawn out process. Mm, I see. Um, you, your final comments on the staff level agreement. Are you certain that the board will approve um, you know, the next tranche of $600 million for the Republic of Ghana? Yeah, it's very, very rare to find a staff level agreement which is not approved by the board. Uh, so I'm sure that would go through. Of course, the key conditionality for board approval is those uh, external assurances from external creditors. I think that is the main critical matter, which, of course, the government of Ghana would have to deal with. And if that, we are going to get some definite commitment before the board level meeting, I don't see any barrier to approve by the IMF board on the second tranche of $600 million. Mm. Uh, development economist Nicolas Sisakagbana joining us there. Uh, Isaac uh, Kofiaje is uh, still with us. Um, Isaac, uh, you know, let's deal with the way forward. Uh, this very agreement that's been reached by, uh, you know, the government of Ghana and uh, the staff of the IMF, uh, what are the next processes and what's the official statement from the IMF indicating to us? Well, so if, if you listen to the IMF, both from the staff level and even the IMF boss, you get the sense that the fund is ready, willing, and available to assist Ghana. All we have to do is to make sure we meet at the target, which according to the, you know, the finance ministry, we've been able to meet most of these targets that we're talking about. And so going forward, we probably are hoping to get that 600 million hit Bank of Ghana's, you know, account by November or by the end of this year, which will bring the total amount under, you know, the first and second tranche to $1.2 billion. By the end of the program, Ghana is hoping to cash in $3 billion. The $3 billion, apart from the $3 billion that IMF has given us, we are also going to get additional funding from the World Bank, which is going to come as a result of this program. And at the moment, we've seen Ghana's external reserves you know, increase all because we are getting this, you know, additional liquidity support from the IMF and we need it. It's a reason why the dollar, the CD is stable. It's a reason why, you know, uh, fuel prices have been kept down. It's a reason why, you know, uh, inflation rates is coming down. And it's also the reason why probably some, some people are saying that even with the projected growth rate of 1.5%, Ghana will go beyond mm. that because we've seen over 3% growth rates in the first and second quarter. Right. And so if you look at the data, it looks as if the IMF program is yielding some sort of result, uh, but it is early days yet. And, and then we are hoping that, you know, the second tranche will not, you know, delay because we are going into the festive season where people will demand more, of, um, you know, foreign liquidity to do more, you know, uh, import. And so uh, looking at the data, uh, government is ready and government is hoping that, you'll get that additional support from the IMF. Okay, uh, we keep uh, monitoring the space. Uh, Isaac Ophir, joining us uh, with the latest in terms of uh, what the implications are behind the figures and the related development. We're also paying attention to the central bank governor, Dr. Ernest Addison, who's now speaking, uh, saying that his decisive measures and that of the government of Ghana have started using, yielding some positive results. Now, Dr. Addison is currently facing some intense criticism from the minority in parliament to say that they will no longer work with the central bank governor due to his failure to resign from office on grounds that his monetary policies have collapsed the Ghanaian economy. 
The minority, which staged a protest uh, earlier this week, says that they will be back on the streets again uh, in demand for the resignation of Dr. Ernest Ardison. But in his very first public appearance and making his comments after the minority protest, Dr. Addison stated that measures put in place by his central bank and the government of Ghana are starting to yield results. Listen. It has been a very comprehensive and collaborative work between the government side and the IMF. And this has made the two-week mission very successful and fruitful, leading to the staff level agreement today. We have all established that the very decisive measures put in place by the government and the Bank of Ghana have started yielding results, signaling a faster than expected turnaround, which needs to be sustained as we reset the economy. More specifically, non-food inflation has dropped significantly by 19 percentage points. Food inflation has also come down by about eight percentage points. Core inflation, which measures underlying inflation, is also decelerating at a fast pace. From the beginning of the year to date, the Bank of Ghana has built reserves of about 650 million US dollars instead of the programmed drawdown of 98 million US dollars. And this has been boosted by the innovative Gold for Reserves program. And as a result, we have seen relative stability in the exchange rate, depreciating by only 2.5% between February and now. Well, so the very first comment uh, from the central bank governor just after the minority staged uh, that protest. So exactly what's the demand of the minority and why would they not cooperate with a man who says that his uh, policies are yielding positive results? Joining us in studio now is Ibrahim Mutala Mohamed, uh, Tamil Central MP and also a member of the Public Accounts uh, Committee. It's been a while. Grateful that you're yes, joining us. It's good to see you. Beautiful uh, <laughs> jacket or mm. you know, call mm. it. But, nice. but, you know, probably the, it's an indication of the economy, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it could also be pretentious. Oh, <laughs> I see. <laughs> That's just by the way. So let's get to, uh, you know, why the minority is making, you know, this uh, plea to the central bank governor to leave office. He says, first of all, that he's not leaving office. And now he's indicating that the policies that he's put in place are beginning to yield results. He also described us as hooligans. Really? Yes. But are you pretending or feigning innocence of what he said when he granted interview, I guess, to a local radio station somewhere and described those who are exercising a right given to them by the Constitution of Ghana as hooligans? Article 21, Clause 1D of the 1992 Constitution says, among others, mm -hmm. that citizens yeah. can use demonstrations as a means of seeking attention redress. or address to issues. It doesn't mean that you should use demonstration as the last resort. You can decide to use it mm -hmm. as a first resort. So for us to be exercising this right, and the, center, the governor of the Central Bank of Ghana described us in a manner that he did is most unfortunate. It is important for us to understand that we have all agreed collectively to charter the path of democracy. Right. And once you agree to charter this part, you should be prepared to give up certain privileges and rights as a, as a citizen. You should be prepared to give up something mm. so that the democracy that you so desire yeah. to be used as a tool to run this country, you know, goes on effectively. And in a democracy, rules and regulations determine the conduct of everybody, including the president right. and also the central bank of Ghana and right. the governor. If you read Article 183 of the 1992 Constitution, it says among others, and in fact, one of, in fact, the first function that the, the, the central bank is expected to discharge as the last lender of resort, the bank of the state. Right. Apart from the fact that it is, only, it is the only bank that has the authority to issue you know, currencies. Mm -hmm. The first function is that the central bank shall promote the domestic currency and maintain its stability. Right. And lawyers will tell you that when you are looking at functions of an institution, the first one that comes deemed to be the most important one. So if you all agree, that the most important function 
of the central bank is to promote the Ghanaian currency and maintain its stability. That should be a yardstick to determine the performance of any central bank governor mm -hmm. because the central bank governor is the head of the central bank. Right. And as to whether you are fit to, you know, hold on to your office or not should be that. He came into office in 2017. Right. As a matter of fact, Dr. Nash was booted out. This government held meetings that had to do with central bank without even inviting him. Now, Dr. Addison took the reign of leadership yes. of central bank. Mm. Tell me whether there has ever been a time under his leadership that we've seen an appreciation of the Ghanaian city. He took it at 3.8 to the dollar. Today, it's 11.6. So if you want to use that as a basis, justifiably so, this man should not spend a second in the office of but central bank. But we heard bank. from the likes of the finance minister, for instance, who's come to the defense of the central bank governor, indicating that the challenges that we're facing as a nation is not unique to Ghana. All central banks have made some level of intervention. Why is it that only Ghana has the highest inflation rate among our peers within the West Africa sub-region? Why is it that only Ghana, indeed, unemplo unemployment is, is escalating? among our peers within the West Africa sub-region? Why is it that it's only in Ghana that we have borrowed so much in the eyes of COVID than any of our neighbors? We got $3 billion from the IMF and got over $300 million, million from the, the, the World Bank and got several grants and assistance. As a matter of fact, we dip our hands into the central bank to withdraw money. So, but I just don't want to yeah. miss the point I was exactly. making. That is the most important function mm -hmm. of the central bank and the governor of the central bank. He failed woefully on that. So it is justified for any citizen to be calling for him to resign because he failed. And that is stated in the Constitution of 1992. Mm -hmm. Now, let's look at the challenges that confront them. And for which reason those challenges were not created by the people of this country. The challenges were created by the maladministration and the incompetence of the Minister for Finance, the, the President, the Vice President, including the Governor. So you expect the Minister for Finance to come and defend him. If the Chief comes home with weird haircut, what does he expect his subject to come home with? They come with tope mm -hmm. And that is why the Minister for Finance and the government would desperately defend him. In the eyes of all these challenges, <laughs> Central Bank themselves reported in their, their financial statement and annual report the losses. that they made losses of $60.8 billion. Now, if you made losses of $60.8 billion, then you should begin acting responsibly. And I'll use an analogy. Right. You are a father who has two kids. Schools have resumed. Your, your kids' colleagues have started going to school. Yeah. Then your kids tell you that we are prepared to go to school and say, no, you can't go to school. They ask you why. You say, well, I haven't paid your school fees. And the children, frustrated and unhappy that they may be, they would understand because their father has not paid. Now, the next day, you, the father, you come home with a new saloon car and a gold watch. And they ask you, daddy, where did you get this car and this watch? Say, oh, I bought the new car and the gold watch. Right. They ask why, so the old car is not befitting of my, sta my, my, my status. How do you think your children would describe you? They would describe you as not just an irresponsible father, but a very wicked father. But, but in the but eyes of all this... Are you overly simplistic? No, the, are you not being no, over, overly in the simplistic? Eyes, I'm asking the question yes. because uh, they seem to be getting to work. Now the IMF says, for instance, the next tranche... 600 million will come uh, the, the the central bank. Uh, I have and just of told course, you that the central bank governor is confident that these measures will resuscitate Listen, the economy. I have economy. just told you that based on what the constitution expect the governor of central bank to do, he has failed woefully. So the idea of whether he is fit to be in office or not, we have gone past that there. But I'm just responding mm -hmm. to the reasons or making a statement why we are where we are. Is it really so, an Addison problem or this is a systemic problem who is the that head, goes beyond who is beyond the, head the head of the central bank well he is the head of the and he's bank. supposed to have some level of independence isn't it yeah now he went ahead succumbed to the whims and caprices of the executive arm and printed 80.1 billion above a threshold that is permitted for him to do by law so it means that he could not even resist the pressure coming from the executive arm so anybody who cannot demonstrate that level of independence is not fit to be the governor. But like I said, right. the idea of whether he is fit or not to be the governor of Central Bank any longer, we have gone past there because the constitutional provision which expects him to maintain the stability of the city, he failed woefully. So he should not even be there. But I am just giving explanations right. why we are where we are. Even in the eyes of making a debt of 60.8 billion, he goes ahead to spend 
$250 million to put up an office. NDC has never said anywhere that, that we don't need an, an office. Okay. We have never said that. But what we have said is that the reason why we're not embarking on this project was because of the circumstances. And we never got, got into this precarious position as we are under this incompetent and corrupt government. Yet still, they go ahead to spend that amount of money. But I want to challenge Joy TV and Joy FM. Go and find out that company that is executing the project, the gold keys. Go and find out the directors, the relationship they have with the president and the minister for finance. Go and find out. Now, in the eyes of all this, you are a media man. Right. They spent 31, 32 million Ghana cities for communication. Ghana, Bank of Ghana already has a PR department. Those who run that department are employees of, of Bank, Bank of Ghana. They are paid every month. Of course, it is understandable that they may, ex they may exercise certain responsibilities which may demand that they need to spend certain money. They have an IT department. So what extraordinary thing did they do such, that would occasion that? Yes. They spent 357 million Ghana cities in the so-called banking supervision. Right. They have a department which responsibility is it to supervise and monitor the activities of all financial institutions. And in all their regional offices, those people have that mandate paid every month Enjoy certain benefits and services that you and I do not benefit. What extraordinary thing did they do to occasion that? What will shock you? Now, they spent 257 million Ghana cities plus $2 million to buy gold watches for retirees of Central Bank. When we raised the issue, they said no. Even in 2016, amount of money was spent. How much was spent? 2 million Ghana cities. You have spent 200 two, two, two uh, 57 million, including 2 million Ghana cities to buy gold watches. Now tell me, yeah. the highest person who should be benefiting in terms of the luxuries of services of Central Bank should be the governor and the two deputies. Which of them have retired? Okay. Which of them? And this money was spent mm. just in 2022. We're trying to look for, for a solution to, to the economic crisis, but you're being accused, that's the minority, that your approach towards the matter is not helping any, any better. Uh, you have decided to hit the streets again, uh, listening to the, the minority leader, Dr. Kezela Tofosin, simply because the um, governor himself did not receive the petition, which means that the uh, protest will continue. Then in parliament, you're declaring Dr. Addison persona non grata, which means that you will not cooperate with him. Is the minority seeking for a, a resolution to this economic crisis, or you're simply trying to make political capital out of this for your own benefit 137 as members of parliament embark on a legitimate demonstration a demonstration which is which right is driven from the 1992 constitution that is half or almost half of the people representative the authority with which we embark on the demonstration was not just the authority coming from us but we are representing people and whatever we do we do them for and on behalf of our people. So half of Ghanaians, right. almost half of Ghanaians, mm -hmm. embarked upon a demonstration, went to the central bank. The central bank governor has two deputies. And beyond the deputies, they have directors whose core responsibility is to ensure mm -hmm. that some of this mess we are experiencing today are not what we witness. They allowed a chief watchman to come and attend to us. We didn't demonstrate against the chief watchman. We demonstrated against the central bank. And in any case, the director for security, what we demonstrated had nothing to do with security. It had to do with mismanagement of the affairs but of But your Bank message has been delivered. Uh, no, no, no. It has to do with mismanagement of the central bank of Ghana. But you see, if anybody thought that we should have accepted and presented the petition to the director for, for, for security, for security. Right. or you can describe him as the, the chief, chief watchman, mm. but that is the responsibility. If anybody thought that we took the thing so far, we should have presented it. Yeah. The subsequent insults that the governor of Central Bank, Dr. Addison, reigned on us for demonstrating our constitutional right and for and behalf of half of the people of this country. He described us as hooligans. Such a person who thought that what we did, we took it extreme, extreme, you know, high. And such a person owes us an apology. 
in the eyes of this direct insult at the people of this country, the people we represent. I think that the man is unfit to man that office. He's unfit to get closer to the central bank. And what explanation did they give for spending $250 million to put up an office? They said that where they are is earthquake prone. Is that not what they said? Yeah. Then they ought not stay there for even a minute, except that they are telling us that they are aware when the earthquake will strike. Look, I attended the University of Ghana, level 100 and level 200. I did archaeology. We had an outstanding lecturer called Dr. Crossland. He told us the entire greater Accra was on an earthquake prone. The entire greater Accra. And in fact, I remember he told us the University of Ghana was seated on a rock. So if it has to do with, with earthquake, and for which reason they think that they need to have another office, they ought not spend even 30 minutes in that office. Look, in a serious country, this man should not spend a day at the Central Bank of okay. Ghana. But you know why? You Parliament. know why? There is a day for reckoning. I see. And probably that may be in Parliament as well. He no, will... not in Parliament. Okay, well, okay, maybe when the elections come. But if he was rational, if he was rational, and I say this with right. all the seriousness, okay. he would have apologized. He would have apologized to the people of this country for using the words he used. But what did he do? He doubled down. He should have apologized. I see. Because for us, Let's we consider about... it just an insult, mm -hmm. yeah. not on the 137 NDC members. Mm -hmm. It was not only NDC members of parliament who were there. Other civil society organizations, mm. PNC, CPP, right. other political parties were there. And this man decided to insult all of us. He should well, be apologized. Well, let, let's wrap up with your decision, what you intend to do as minority in parliament. If you're not dealing with the Bank of Ghana any longer, then there will be crisis. We will demonstrate to Dr. Ad. I'm not too sure whether I should attach that doctor. Because a person with PAD should act responsibly. And people exercising their democratic right, you feel that you must insult them. I really don't think that he's fit to be addressed with that title. So if you permit me, I want to be very clear to Mr. Addison. And I, and I, I say this with all the seriousness. What they witnessed on that day is nothing but a tip of an iceberg. We will embark on massive demonstrations. And the demonstrations are going to be consistent. Because until he indeed become humble, meet us and receive the petition, or ask any of his deputies to receive the petition. If they had done that, we wouldn't have done anything. You see, the demonstration was very peaceful. And let me make this point very clear. The peaceful nature of every demonstration is not determined by the security. It is determined by the conveyors of the demonstration and the participants. You remember when we said we're going to embark on this demonstration? They said, oh, it, may, it will be chaotic. And right. we said, look, we are law-abiding citizens. We are very responsible individuals. And those who are going to be participating in the demonstration are all citizens who appreciate the enormity of the laws and the need for the laws to be protected. And that was what we demonstrated. The next demonstration is going to be massive. It's going to be massive until he began realizing that he must indeed show some level of respect to individuals who have been elected by citizens of this country to chair, chair the affairs of this country. And in fact, in all front, Mr. Addison has failed woefully. And it's embarrassing and shameful that a person with PhD will make the kinds of statements okay. he made. Uh, uh, we need to go. What, what will be that final appeal? Uh, the appointing authority is the president. Any message to him? If the fish is going to rot, certainly start from the head. The TV and the stealing all happens at the Flagstaff House. Everything that happens in this country. And I'm surprised that people are not talking about that. If the Flagstaff House could add over $800 million to American renegotiation, isn't this thievery? So what do you expect people who are working under such a leader to do? And that is why I said, What's that mean? What's the meaning? If the chief comes home, would we wear a haircut? The subject will come home with tapejo. And that is what <laughs> and, that, and the Minister for Finance are doing. I mean, the only Minister for Finance <laughs> whose ministry was waiting for him, even when he was in this post. We're, we're in the era of haircuts, so when you're talking about the styles, you need to be very careful. <laughs> I'm grateful that you've been able to is spend some, some time with us this afternoon. Uh, that's uh, Mutala Mohamed, uh, Tamale Central MP, and also a member of the Public Accounts Committee. We're taking a break here on The Pulse. When we get back, we'll uh, resume, you know, the dialysis crisis and why we need solutions. We'll talk about that shortly. Please. This afternoon, we're focusing on the dialysis crisis uh, with a special focus on the 
32-year-old Ubaid Salam, who was supposed to be discharged over a month ago at the Upper West Regional Hospital, where she was admitted to the medical ward. She was diagnosed to have a kidney disease, prompting medical doctors to refer her to the dialysis center for treatment and later to be discharged. Well, due to her unpaid bills, which are pegged now around 5,800 Ghana cities at the time, Ubeida is unable to leave the hospital and has piled up an additional 4,200 Ghana cities in the last handful of weeks uh, due to the dialysis treatment. Joining Susan for West Regional Correspondent, Rafik Salam is now reporting that her bills have now risen to a little over 10,000 Ghana cities as she is calling on government and other benevolent organizations to come to her aid to offset her bills to enable her go home. In charge of the dialysis center of the Upper West Regional Hospital, Kusa Daniel removed the veil on the myths surrounding dialysis. Especially within our community here, people think like when you are having kidney problem and you are supposed to do dialysis, it's a death warrant. But it is not so. So we are doing our best to actually demystify that uh, perception that the public hold. The dialysis center of the Upper West Region Hospital was established in November 2022 and has since attended to by dozens of patients. One of them, a 32 year old Ubede Salam, she cannot exactly state when she had a kidney disease that requires dialysis, except to list the symptoms that force her to come to the hospital for a medical examination. I had swollen legs, bloated stomach, puffy face, and high blood pressure. I have never been to the hospital without the doctors telling me I have high blood The mother of three every week comes to the dialysis center twice for treatment. She is required to pay at least 450 Ghana cities for each session, an amount that she struggles to pay considering the petty business that she is in selling soft drinks and seche water carrying them overhead. Her husband is a massacre man, but better hard work that can take care of the family, let alone paying for dialysis. It is difficult for us to pay for the dialysis. Sometimes we owe them, and any time we get the money, we pay back. Our being here is being taken care of by our blood relations. We are very poor. My husband cannot afford the 450 Ghana cities. Without the support of my family, I would have been dead by now. Ubede was supposed to be discharged by the hospital a month ago so that she could come into the center for the dialysis. She is out of unable because she cannot offset her medical bills. Her medical bills at the hospital is a little over 10,000 Ghana cities, including the dialysis, which has defaulted payment of 4,200 Ghana cities. Because of the cost involved, so especially this woman, she's supposed to have gone home, I think last month, last two months, and be coming for dialysis. But because of cost, they can't even offset the hospital bill at the ward level. So they are forced to be here and be coming for the dialysis until they pay the bill, then they go. So for her like this, it's the cost that is keeping her. If not, she would have been home and be coming for dialysis. Unemployed middle age, Maria Yahya is a mother-in-law of Obeda. She says they are at their wit ends and seem to exhaust all channels to enable them for the medical bills. We have nowhere to go for money again, and yet our bills are piling up. It is because we are unable to offset our bills. That is why we are still here. Our people have helped us a lot. Can we continue to go to them? Ubeda appeals to the government to consider adding dialysis to the list of medication on the National Health Insurance Scheme. Government should take a second look at our plight and include dialysis on NHIS.
Medical Director of the Upper West Region Hospital, Dr. Robert Amesia, however, wants a conversation or prevention of kidney diseases. I think prevention is always better than cure. People are selling all manner of concoctions that people consume. Some are very toxic to the kidneys. What about that? So it's emotional to have people who are suffering that are struggling to get help. But how do we prevent people from getting to do that stage? Because if we don't prevent, uh, we thought we didn't have enough patients who would have been requiring dialysis until we started our center. And we realized that even the three machines that we have are not adequate. So it means that what we're even seeing is a tip of the iceberg. So this issue of affordability, we need to resituate it well. If everything is provided, and you are able to do it for free. Why not? For now, patients undergoing dialysis at the hospital can only be grateful to the hospital for having such a facility which their survival hinges on. They are rather pressing on the government to, in the future, be able to work through the jigsaw puzzle to make the financing of dialysis treatment free in the country. Reporting for Joy News, Rafik Salam. Wow. And what a touching story there uh, by uh, Rafiq Salam on the situation of Obeda. You could also uh, just come through by helping here. But we've been also uh, seeking some answers from government. And that was done on the Joy News Talk Leadership event, uh, which was held in our studios. And presidential advice on health doctor in Sia Asari revealed that the National Health Insurance Authority has already uh, set up a committee to review and assess whether or not the NHIS can absorb the cost of the dialysis um, treatment. This was uh, corroborated by the Director of Corporate Affairs by the NHIA, Oswald Mensa, at the same event uh, which brought together all stakeholders. Dr. Nsian Saria also revealed that the process to uh, make kidney transplant available in Ghana is underway with a document being reviewed uh, for a law that will now have us store and donate some of these organs. Uh, Maxila Kuba has more in this report. I'm What's very angry. What's your story? I am very angry. I'm more angry at this morning. People are dying each day. The dialysis machine in Kolebu got for Voice of activist Nasiba Bauer at a protest demanding a reduction in the cost of dialysis treatment after the Kolebu Teaching Hospital increased the cost from 380 CDs to 765 Ghana CDs. The amount has since been reversed. It triggered the dialysis crisis series on Joy News highlighting the plight of 54-year-old Georgina Pia who couldn't afford the cost of dialysis. 15-year-old Priscilla Sante, who died some hours after she was featured in the series, pleading for assistance with her dialysis treatment. Some patients with kidney failure held a press conference and said 14 of their members have died between May and September after the Kolebu Teaching Hospital limited its dialysis treatment to just emergency cases. The hospital said it had run out of consumables. The renal patients who said they were being sponsored were now compelled to pay for dialysis treatment in other facilities. Speaking during the stakeholders' event held in the studios of Joy, Chief Executive Officer of the Kolibu Teaching Hospital, Dr. Poku Wariampuma, said the decision was taken because the Kolibu Teaching Hospital RENA unit is suffocating under a 4 million Ghana cities debt. He's unsure when the services will be made available to outpatients. He says the facility will also need 961,000 Ghana cities monthly to keep the cost of dialysis at 380 Ghana cities. We are now engaged with government, with the ministry, with other stakeholders to see how quickly we can you know, find the resources to advance. Because at the moment we are sitting in a 4 million uh, city hall. If we are to operate at uh, our uh, current capacity, which is about 2,000 uh, dialysis sessions every month, then it means that we are going to accumulate about 961,000 cities of debt every month, uh, you know, in addition to the 4 million cities that we have already. So this is financially unsustainable. You can't tell when exactly the OPD will be opened? Yes, exactly. You can't tell? I can't, yes. Okay. And
No, no, so it's formula. We have a formula on deficit. Deficit. Okay. And then if you are to run at full capacity, okay. we will need about 961,000 cities uh, subsidy every month to be able to maintain the current prices. Presidential advice on health, Dr. Antonin Siansari says steps have been taken to settle the debt. We are waiting for what they are supposed to bring and then to be worked on as quickly as possible. The money is provided, is supposed to be provided by the Minister of Finance, isn't it? Yes. yes. Okay. So Dr. Tampuma has to put everything that he is doing, that is being asked to do, as quickly as possible in place. If I were him, I would use 24 hours to put everything in place You've and present it. Place. Yeah, so they will present have. it. You've already presented and, uh, no, you're free, free, free to talk because yeah, this, is, this is direct. This I've is, told him what to do. Yeah. And then quickly, I'm sure I know what normally such things are very dear to the heart of the authorities. And it will be done. Kidney failure patient Kojo Bafwa in crisis. Most of his colleagues feel they are a burden on society, with friends deliberately not answering their calls. Now we are becoming a burden to the society. You pick a phone, you pick a phone, you want to call your friend. He knows you are coming to ask for money, so you will not even pick. Wow. You pick a phone, maybe you want to even to say hello, maybe there's an information you are trying to ask him. He will not even answer it. Later on, he will call back and say, Oh, child, I saw your call, now this I'm well. It's not true, because he knew you are coming to ask money. And it's true. When you call the person, it's money. President of the Ghana Kidney Association, Professor Samson Inchi, says all children with end-stage kidney in Ghana die. He says immediate dialogue and action is needed to make dialysis accessible and affordable to all. When it comes to children, it's pathetic because um, we don't have any facility for children. And uh, where I practice, for all these years, any child who gets to the end stage kidney disease dies. And the number is quite huge. And so, but there are many more who also pass in our health facilities. All the children die. And many adults can also initiate it. So the second problem has been the cost of treating kidney failure. It is so expensive that we should not allow people to pay out of their pockets. What we see um, in Confanoche, uh, take note of this assistance, it's quite a uh, uh, um, uh, uh, settling statistics. We see every year between 25 to 40 children who come with end-stage kidney disease and they will all die because, of course, we don't even talk about initiating chronic dialysis. Former General Secretary of the Ghana Medical Association, Dr. Titus B. you wants dialysis treatment to be made free. If we are looking at it, I think ultimately dialysis must be free. Mm. And we have to have a funding mechanism my other submission on this is that if you look at the kidney situation we are discussing, the prevalence of chronic kidney disease, about 17% in Ghana, means that this condition is even more prevalent than HIV. Has it gotten the needed attention like HIV? So we need perhaps a separate entity, maybe a National Kidney Health Authority or a chronic, dis chronic um, diseases or non-communicable diseases authority to engage in surveillance for these conditions, proper research on the etiology. Director of Corporate Affairs at the National Health Insurance Authority, Oswald Mensa, says the NHIE has set up a committee to review and assess whether the NHIS can absorb the cost of dialysis after Joy FM's dialysis crisis series. As it stands today, there's conversations, um, and this has started, of course, based on your um, documentary. Um, even at the NHI level, the board is discussing, um, there's a committee that has been set up to have these conversations about dialysis, its implications, um, if NHI can do anything about it, and most importantly, make recommendations for the policymakers. And I'm happy Senior says there's a lot happening in that space. The Ministry of Health drives policy in our landscape. So whatever recommendations that the board will come up with will be passed on to the ministry and the policymakers for a direction on where we... And did you say that a committee has now been set up to review and consider whether you can afford to uh, take the dialysis cost? Is that what it is? Yes. Okay. Before NHIA can take on any disease condition, we must do actual studies. In Presidential advice on health, Dr. Antonin Siasari revealed the process to make kidney transplant available in Ghana is underway with a document being reviewed for a law on the harvesting, storage and donation of organs. There's a document which is being reviewed 
so that we have a law. It's very, very important. It has to go through cabinet for cabinet approval and then move to parliament for parliamentary uh, approval and uh, the president will assent to it. So that we can harvest the organ, we can uh, store the organ and also donate the organ. It's not only for kidney because even for the in vitro fertilization that they are doing, it's a tissue. Skin from other person to another person, it's a tissue. So all these things should be backed by law. And that is what is going on. And as I said, I'm very key. He's very key. Everybody is key. The Ghana Kidney Association, the Ghana mm. Ophthalmological Association, and then even the Plastic Surgery Association and the IVF team are all on us. And some of us have taken up as our, because I'm a doctor, mm. first and foremost, that this thing should be done and done as quickly as possible. And then as he rightly, as the Dr. Ampuma said also, we are building the capacity of our surgeons. Actually, kidney transplant is one of the most not so complicated things that we can do as any surgeon can do. And we know that uh, there's also a urology unit which is almost completed at Kolebu. It will be part of the place where we can have also renal transplant done and to train our uh, doctors and our nurses and all the health workers to go into that type of field. We are working on that. I know that there's a document which is, which is being uh, looked at at the moment. Well, uh, as signed to dialysis crisis, we know that another health crisis is looming today. The network of persons living with HIV saying uh, there is a shortage of life-saving antiretroviral medications across the country. Some facilities, the network uh, reveals, have been forced to prescribe children's antiretrovirals for adults, uh, with some uh, taking medications meant for children as well. Uh, others are uh, report, resorted to taking some expired antiretroviral drugs and uh, there's a need for us to get through the statement that's just been released by uh, the network while we bring in uh, you know the network to provide some further clarification on this that we're receiving so let's get to you know the details of the concerns by uh, this uh, network but uh, we can now uh, of course uh, hear from Elsie uh, Elsie is uh, with uh, the network. Uh, we'll be hearing from them shortly uh, because uh, they are raising some of the concerns uh, in this very statement, which we'll uh, bring to you shortly. Uh, but uh, also joining the conversation uh, is uh, the director uh, for the AIDS uh, Commission. That's uh, Dr. Stephen Etoahine, who's also uh, joining us. Uh, let me start off with you, Dr. Etoahine, and then we'll get to the uh, concerns while we uh, progress uh, with this conversation. The point about what our status is. Is it the case that as a country, uh, we're beginning to, you know, uh, defund or perhaps we've lost adequate funding uh, for the fight against HIV? What's our status now? Dr. Ajayini, you'd have to unmute so we can get the point you're sharing with us. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. Um, yes, I guess you are asking about the financial status of the HIV program. Yes, precisely, sir. Okay, right. Um, I think I've said it before, and I will repeat now as well that Ghana requires about $133 million annually to provide the full range of HIV services uh, in the country. And the amount we have is just about $31.2 million every year for each year. Uh, that amount is from donor sources. And so we have a funding gap of more than uh, 67%. Uh, and so for the five year period, the funding gap is around $445 million. Now it is so because all the Commodities that we use are imported. They are not manufactured here. And we use hard currency to, to procure them. And so our donors have been providing these medicines, 
with the expectation that government will supplement uh, procurement of these medicines so that we can have adequate medicines for the people living with HIV. But mm. unfortunately, that hasn't happened. And so uh, considering the funding gap, it means we also have supply gaps when it comes to HIV commodities. Okay, uh, here's what I want us to do. Uh, let's do a recap of the concerns being raised by persons living with uh, HIV. Um, we have excerpts of, uh, you know, what it is that uh, they are concerned on the screens right now, pointing out uh, some of the key concerns they are raising. They are equally uh, pointing out that there is complete shortage of life-saving uh, medication and now we have you know some persons living with HIV uh, taking uh, drugs that are even meant uh, for children and uh, some are even going to the extent of using expired medication here's what we'll do LCIA is the national president of the network of persons living with HIV she's also on with us Elsie j just give us a sense of what your concerns are then we can hear from Dr. Etienne on, on what the way uh, forward should be and, and probably explore the implications uh, we'll, we'll get to Elsie for you uh, shortly, but there you have it, the statement uh, pointing out and, you know, just summarizing their uh, entire concerns. And, of course, their investigations are also revealing that in some facilities as well, uh, you have uh, the medication, which is meant for children, being used for adults. And, uh, you know, there's uh, a case where some of them are even using expired products as well. Dr. Uh, the point about the implications for our uh, fight against the HIV. Uh, we know that you were pointing out earlier uh, this year that your figures are surging. Uh, if this is a situation where we find ourselves in as a country, uh, then the figures might go further, higher, right? Yes, um, you are right. Uh, but let me clarify that, yes, the concern raised uh, correct. We have checked and the, uh, the, they are facts. Uh, but the situation is that the, the commodities are in country, except that they are locked up at the ports and due to delayed payment of port charges. And so uh, it's not as if we don't have drugs. In fact, there, there are a number of uh, different HIV drugs uh, that we use in the country. We have drugs for first line, second line, and third line. Now, this particular combination that is uh, Abacavir and the Lamovitin combination, uh, the ones that we do not have now in the health facilities. And hopefully, um, we believe they, they will be released very soon uh, to augment what we already have in the system. Uh, I understand the Ghana Health Service has released some money to the clearing agent to clear the containers that are locked up at the Okay, uh, is it and the case I that, hope, you, you, what's, the, what's the mechanism? Uh, Mr. Dr. Chahini, if you can hear me, uh, just give us some clarification on this. What's the mechanism for bringing in some of these drugs? They are life-saving drugs. Um, don't you liaise with the Ghana Health Service at least to get a waiver on these life-saving drugs? No, the, the waiver has already been granted by parliament mm -hmm. and waiver is applied to these, not only the, uh, the HIV drugs, also all the HIV related commodities. And so is it for malaria commodities and uh, uh, TB, uh, which are donated by the global fund. Um, because it is a donation, uh, the government grants these waivers. Uh, the problem is that we have about six different uh, clearance char clearing charges at the court, which are not necessarily waivers. And when they delay and they go into demorage, and demorage costs also add up. Uh, however, I must admit that we have two levies uh, on, on, on these commodities, and these are ECOWAS and AU levies. And these ones, um, we got as a member, uh, count, member country of these uh, two regional organizations, uh, we will have to work with Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration uh, to get ECOWAS and AU to waive these uh, 
levies so that we, it will be 100% levy free or detail free uh, commodities. That is being worked on. But presently, what we need to focus on is to prevent the kind of uh, uh, activities or the way the healthcare workers are trying to, you know, address the problem, giving, you know, medicines meant for children, children to adults, and <clears throat> excuse me, and giving out expired drugs. We don't have the evidence to uh, validate these claims, but um, we also know that the source uh, can't be trusted. And so it is not a good practice to do that. And I will encourage, I will urge all healthcare workers who are involved in this kind of uh, practice to, you know, desist from that. Figures, there's a need for us to revisit that and, and some preventive measures as well. Uh, but, you know, I understand LC is also uh, joining our conversation as well. So let's also hear from them because they are, uh, you know, with the network uh, of persons living with a condition. Um, Elsie, what's your story and why are you alarmed as a network about you know, the situation, the shortage as, as, as it is? Thank you very much for having me on this program. But before I continue, I want to make one clarification. Um, we were, none of us were given expired drugs. Mm. When our clients, our members went to the facility for their medication, they were told that, I mean, there were no medication. All that they had were drugs that had expired. We know the batches. And then we always look at, make sure that, we, that what we are given is, you know, within the time frame that we, we could take them safely. These medications expired in September, just a few days ago. So knowing the, the um, negative effects of not being on medication, our members said, rather give us the expired drugs. We would rather take expired drugs than not take anything. So that was what happened. Of course, we were not given, they were not given that medication because they were expired. So that was where the issue of expired drugs came into the story. No health staff gave us expired drugs. Our members said they would rather take expired drugs than no medication at all. Uh, yeah. I mean, so what would be the way forward now in terms of how you intend to uh, make up for the shortage? Obviously, the, the, there must be some stopgap measure before, of course, the intervention comes through. Stopgap from whose point of view? We are just to go to the facility and get our medications. And that was what we confidently do every time um, we have to go to the clinic. And we knew that these medications were at the harbor. We had talked about it. We had made moves to ensure that um, the, 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 the medications were now okay for us to, to uh, um, access. But then surprisingly, it, was, it came as a surprise two days ago when we heard that at Kolebu, there were no medications, the med the, the, there were no medications, especially the Abakavir Lamivudin, which is in the hub, which we know specifically that it's among those drugs still at the hub. Oh, okay, so, so what are you urging or advising your members to do now, um, knowing that the, the drugs are in short supply. I'm just wondering. Our what members the can't are. do anything. We are mm. all doing what we are doing now. We are calling on the government to remove that tax waiver. We know that the medication is free. We, well, free in the sense that they were bought for us. Let's say they were donated. Why should our country ask, task those, tax those medications that had come in free? That's what we don't understand. That is what we find very difficult to understand. So is, is that tax more important than the lives of the number of PLHIVs who are virally suppressed at this time, who have to continue taking the, 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 their medication so that we remain healthy, we don't transmit HIV, and we also enable our country to reach that target that we are all heading towards. That is AIDS-free um, uh, population by 2030. We don't want the new infections coming on board. And the more we get virally su suppressed. Mm. 
Uh, well, LC, your point is well made there. Uh, Dr. Chiang, as we wrap up, you, you must be concerned about this. So yes. what, what, what are the, the marching... We can't... Yeah, Dr. Chiang, what are the marching orders now? Along the line. <laughs> the problem, the issue is that, you know, the persons living with HIV depend on antiretroviral medicines for their sustenance, for their continued existence. And so any break in supply means that they are, we are putting their lives at risk. And at no point in time should we allow what is happening to uh, happen. Mm. And so uh, as government, this matter is taken very seriously and we need to uh, address it. And I'm happy, I just as I've said uh, uh, previously, that some payment has been made. What I expect is that Ghana Health Service will prioritize the HIV commodities uh, to get them released immediately, because there are several containers of various health commodities at the port which are in the same category of uh, delay, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the same category of uh, non-clearance. And so uh, it is very necessary that the priority is given to the HIV commodities, especially if the money paid is not enough to get all the containers released. And so that is what I will urge the Ghana Health Service to do. Right at the moment because okay. any break in supply of uh, antiretroviral medicines to people living with HIV is a serious risk mm. to their lives and we should not do anything to undermine uh, their, their uh, lives. Thank yeah. you. Grateful, Dr. Etiohini, for spending some time with us. Uh, also to you, Elsie, uh, we'll definitely be monitoring development and bring you some updates. Time now to talk politics and developments in the uh, West African SAP region because the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, is deploying a stringent measure to support a credible election in the Republic of Liberia. Together with the African Union, an independent team is working with the National Electoral Commission to assess the coalition and also tallying of electoral results. This follows the heightened uh, mistrust within Liberian society over the credibility of the national Electoral Commission, our correspondent, uh, joining us live uh, from Liberia, is Donay al Jima, who is uh, going to be uh, monitoring uh, the 2023 presidential uh, and uh, legislative elections in Liberia. He's joining us now with more. Uh, Nanayal, thank you uh, for spending some time with us. But first of all, uh, it's a, a good time also to listen to the ECOWAS mission, uh, which has addressed the press on what to expect in the coming days. Society organizations the executive, the legislature, to the judiciary. Your, meet, your arrival here has been preceded by many engagements that ECOWAS Commission has had here in Liberia. We've had a, an exploratory mission that, are, that arrived here in February. The, the essence of that engagement was to assess what was going on in Liberia as we worked um, towards an electoral process that ensured free, fair, transparent, inclusive, credible, and peaceful elections. After they left, following their recommendations, we stepped up our engagement with national stakeholders here in Liberia to ensure that the process was on track, to identify the issues, and to find ways to address these issues. Undoubtedly, we have seen some level of delays in the electoral process and particularly with the calendar of activities. This was primarily because the, at the initial stages of um, turning from an OMR system to a BVR, the procurement process itself was fraught with challenges. However, with a lot of backdoor diplomacy, we managed to overcome that. But the ripple effect was that we had time constraints with the elections calendar. In fact, there was a point where we thought that we may not be able to hold elections 
on October 10th, 2023. And so for me, personally, I see it as a commendation to the National Elections Commission to striving to, assure, to ensure that elections are held on the constitutionally mandated date, which is October 10th. Ladies and gentlemen, this year in particular, or this particular election presents a peculiarity for us. I understand that in the 100-year history of Liberia, this is the first time where you are having the incumbent and the main opposition party, one having tasted power before and wanting to come back to power. Sorry. Better, yeah, thank you. <laughs> one having tasted power for 12 years and seeking to be re-elected and of course the incumbent also seeking to be re-elected. This is the first time in 100 years of Liberia's um, political history. So of course the stakes are high, and because the stakes are high, it behoves us to be extra vigilant in assessing and um, addressing the concerns that have arisen. In the last few weeks, we have seen a growth, a spate of inflammatory rhetoric in the public space. And that has raised concerns for many of us in the international community as well as the, the national, the, the Liberian community itself. <coughs> in order to ensure that we escalate our conversations, it was necessary for us to uh, invite ahead his ex, um, Professor Jega um, to come and assess the situation as head of mission and to have some high level engagement with um, political leaders. We believe that the engagements we held were successful. We received the reassurance of political leaders that they are committed to a peaceful electoral process. We are also keenly aware that in spite of all of the preparations that NEC has done, we have a few, NEC being the National Elections Commission, forgive me, we have a few outstanding matters that need to be attended to. And we're working round the clock to support the national efforts, complement the roles that they have played and the, what they've put in place so that we can have an enhanced transparent election. There is mistrust within the rank and file of the Liberian society. Mistrust that is largely driven by political rhetoric. And even though we believe that the, 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 the transparency of the, of the process here, particularly around results management, tallying and collation, meets best, best practices, we nonetheless hear a lot of um, negativity and, and criticism um, towards the National Elections Commission. In these last few days, we have held engagements with the National Elections Commission, engaging them to step up their communication strategy to dispel rumors, reduce fear and anxiety, and enable the Liberian people understand that elections is just another democratic exercise um, that we need to engage in, in entrenching our democratic processes. Having said that, I think it's also important for us to state that elections is the business of every one of us. And so in Liberia, um, through the various engagements we've had on the ECOWAS, using the ECOWAS platform, we have sought to encourage that level of um, involvement of all. Liberia has a predominantly youthful population over 60% of them are, of the Liberian population is under 35 years old. And that can be a force for good. By the Economic Community of West African States, the country uh, representative, Josephine Nkrumah, addressing the press there. But let's cross you over now to Liberia, where Nana al is joining us there for more. It's been 24 hours since your arrival. Um, how's the euphoria like uh, catching up among citizenry ahead of the elections? which is just uh, days away. So driving from the airport through to Monrovia, and this morning also going through town, um, things are very, very calm here in Monrovia. 
um, you, you don't get the sense of an election impending um, until you see these billboards and, and posters all over. Um, that is when you understand that there's something coming up. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, this is a very, very important election for the people here in Liberia. Um, many of them continue to talk about the election, especially when you monitor the local radio stations here in Liberia. Now, the issue is whether the National Electoral Commission, um, they, whether they have credible data to help ensure that the election is free and fair on Monday. And uh, this is what the Economic Community of West African States, the, the election observer team, is working together with the NEG to ensure that all doubts are cleared on the minds of people. As you heard Madame Josephine Enkroma say, um, already there's a team, an, a, an, an independent IT team on the ground to ensure that they collaborate with the National um, Electoral Commission to ensure that all the bottlenecks or all the challenges that the, the various aspirants and also the people of Liberia have with the register is, is sorted before Monday. I see, and that's a crucial point to, to take note of. Um, why is the SAB regional body ECOWAS concerned about a peaceful election in Liberia? We know that this is the very first uh, post the uh, United Nations monitoring group um, and force to stabilize peace in the country uh, after prolonged periods of uh, civil war. Beyond these concerns, why is ECOWAS concerned about a peaceful elections in Liberia this year? From the um, ECOWAS delegation to Liberia, um, they are very aware of the issues that um, the, the civil war or the civil unrest that was in Liberia some time ago. And for about 15 years or more, the place have been calm. So this is the reason why the ECOWAS wants to ensure that there is continuous calmness in Liberia and also the, the ECOWAS wants to deepen the democracy within Liberia. Already we understand or we know that there are issues with overthrow in other parts of West Africa and this is, um, you know, is, such issues continue to rise within the West African states. So ECOWAS wants to um, let the, send a strong signal to the whole of West Africa that democracy is still the way to go. So they've taken a very, very um, important role in this particular election, especially with the, working together with the National Electoral Commission to ensure that everything that they are doing is in due course. And also, they would want to ensure that the people of Liberia continue to understand that democracy is the only way to go. Finally, there's a need for us to talk about the head of the mission uh, doing the long-term observation of this democratic process. Uh, what reaction have you been getting from them at this news briefing uh, earlier today? So this morning, the um, observer, the, uh, uh, the, the whole of the observer team here in Kenya, uh, in, in Liberia, to be precise, um, we're in a meeting and the people have been, ta be, be, been taken through the do's and don'ts when it comes to being an observer in this election. And after that, the leadership of the observer team went to the UN office to meet with diplomats here in um, uh, Liberia. They've been discussing a lot of issues. Unfortunately, the media didn't get entrance or we didn't get access to this meeting. Um, the, uh, what we understand is that pressing issues that um, that needed to be raised today were raised in that meeting. There was supposed to be a press conference, a joint press conference organized by the National um, Electoral Commission together with the ECOWAS. Unfortunately, um, due to some reasons, this meeting or this press conference has been postponed but the ECOWAS continue to work closely together with the um, w w with the electoral commission here in Liberia things are very very calm and the ECOWAS team is on the grounds and ensuring that they they, they they deal with all the pending issues or the issues that have been raised by various um, aspirants and also the electorate
of uh, Nana Aljima joining us uh, there from Liberia. He will be on the grounds uh, to cover the 2023 Liberian election, which is just underway uh, in a couple of days. Uh, but we now take you to Europe because this week Germany is celebrating 33 years since its reunification as events take place to remember the dramatic occurrences that led to the Merging of the two ideologically opposed systems, a reference is uh, often made to how German society and public life continue to be shaped by the division between East and West and how the country's extraordinary history influences its current role on the world stage. Uh, to talk uh, to us more about this, I'm joined by DW's Kate Ferguson in Berlin. Kate, how do Germans view this reunification today? speaking Germans would see reunification as a success because if you really think about how extraordinary this was you had two countries with radically opposed ideologies separated by a literal wall almost overnight becoming one and if you put it into that context it really is a success that we have a Germany for the last three decades that has seen relative political and economic stability something you can't really take for granted that said though there are still divisions between East and West particularly on an economic level. Wages in the former East Germany are significantly lower than in the West and that has a lot to do with the brain drain that happened following reunification. There have been efforts made to address these sort of structural differences though and a report by the German government out this week pointed out that the pensions between East and West, there was no longer a difference between them because that had long been a bone of contention. There are other positive developments as well. Um, we actually saw a big investment investment by the American company Intel in the eastern German city of Magdeburg recently. Um, they invested 33 billion euros into a chip making factory there. That was one of the biggest sources of foreign investment in Germany ever and a particularly symbolic one given Magdeburg's location and history. So I would say there is still a divide but it is getting less. Indeed, uh, and many are talking about Germany's current ruling coalition government uh, facing some enormous challenges, including, um, you know, issues ranging from the rise in support for the far right uh, alternative for German uh, party. Uh, to what extent can we say that some of these historical divisions between the East and West are playing a major role in this trend that we're seeing? Well, it is true that support for the far-right AFD is greater in the former East Germany than in the West. In the states of Thuringia, Saxony and Brandenburg, they are polling at about 30%, which is a real um, challenge for the mainstream political parties in Germany. But they are also doing quite well in the Western states. We have elections coming up in uh, Bavaria and Hesse, both in the former West Germany this weekend. And the AFD is expected to get around 15% of the vote there. So definitely definitely not insignificant. There are a number of factors uh, why that explain maybe why the AFD is rising at the moment. The German economy is not faring well. There are a number of reasons to explain this. But at the same time, we have had uh, we have seen a, a large rise in the number of people um, arriving in Germany to seek asylum. And while those two trends have nothing to do with each other, it's something that the far right often conflates. So, so we do have a, a couple of things that might be playing into the rising support there. That said, I think experts would be keen to point out that the divide between rural and urban areas is actually more significant when it comes to support for the AFD than the difference between East and West. People in rural areas are far more likely to vote for that party than, um, than their counterparts in cities. This way, three decades since reunification, uh, Germany has struggled to define its uh, identity on the world stage. How does the country see its... Uh Self, uh, in the international uh, space today as we speak. Well, yeah, for a long time, Germany preferred to uh, have a, a little bit of a backseat role when it came to international affairs. They, they favoured a, a non-interventionist, quite a passive approach. But that has actually changed dramatically under the leadership of Chancellor Olaf Scholz. And that's a direct consequence of Russia's war in Ukraine. After that, Scholz announced uh, what's been known as a Zeitenwende. That loosely translates as a change of epoch. And it refers to a real shift in Germany 
German policy in a variety of areas when it comes to defense spending, for example, or the willingness to uh, to send heavy weapons to war zones, but also to other areas like uh, the, the decision to wean itself off Russian gas and, and to adopt a more decisive stance in its relations to China. So I would say that 33 years after German reunification, um, circumstance have actually dictated that Germany is now taking a more assertive role on the world stage. Okay, uh, Ferguson, thank you for the latest from Berlin. The Kumasi edition of the Habitat Fair is uh, ongoing at the Kumasi City Mall with exhibitors uh, here uh, in Ghana, and I mean the Ashanti region, offering uh, some exciting solutions uh, to partners. So let's get more uh, on what's happening uh, there today, uh, because the Lava FM Republic Bank Habitat Fair is uh, the one-stop shop for homeowners and also uh, prospects, uh, and those who are doing some prospecting as far as uh, housing is concerned. Uh, let's cross over and get the very latest uh, for you. Massive. Well, when I visited some of the exhibitors, they say they recorded lots of patronage from clients. So I'm very sure that it's going to be the same today because I have, because, well, I'm about visiting some of the stands and I've already seen patrons coming in. So, I mean, we are in for a good time. Well, let me also move to the stand of some exhibitors and I would like to visit the stand of our headline sponsor, that is Republic Bank. Well, series of interviews that we've had with them shows that they are offering amazing discounts and deals for exhibitors. So I'm at the stand of uh, Republic Bank PLC. Let me see if I can get any staff to speak to. Hello, Leila. My name is Mona Lisa. Nice to meet you. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. I'm fine, thank you. Okay, well, it's nice meeting you in Kumasi. Well, I hope I'll take you to the best fufu joint so you can edge. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. So, sure, uh, what's Republic Bank offering uh, patrons for this year's edition of the Habitat Fair. I know you have amazing discounts, you know. So tell us more. You said it right, yes, Mona. So amazing discounts. We are currently running our ultra low interest rates. So it means that we have been low and we are going lower. So we are currently running the ultra low interest rates. So it means that your regular rate is now going to go even below the competitive ones that we have. So when you come to the Habitat Fair this time around, you're going to walk away with some savings. It's not just for down. It goes goes up until the 20, 31st of January 2024. So you have enough time to take a decision, get a mortgage from the mortgage masters. Okay, so would you, um, when it comes to access, uh, assessing my credit score, um, I, I'm a middle income earner. When we talk about mortgages, most of the time people feel it's for a certain class of people. Okay, so that's a myth that we have consistently trying to debunk. Mortgage is accessible to anybody who earns. The difference is what you qualify for. So, for instance, if you definitely earn like 50,000 a month, you can't, I mean, you can only afford what you can afford. And someone who earns 1,800 will also afford what they can afford. But I, I mean, objectively, once you earn an amount, you definitely qualify for a property which is within your budget. The problem is that we usually want to look at um, the end. We want the big house, the dream house. However, for a first time home, you want to get something that will take you away from being a tenant to being a landlord, to owning your home. It's not your dream home first. It's what you would take you away from being that tenant so that you can save towards your dream home. So what am I saying? I'm just saying that whatever you qualify for today, deal with that maybe it's a two bedroom simple house and then while you are saving that lump sum that you would have probably paid for the landlord you can get access to your dream home so anybody everybody who earns would qualify for amounts yes okay and also um let me also ask uh, so i know that last year you were on board and well i overheard it was been rumored that republic bank really made lots of sales that day and um, i mean was that true and i think it's true i need not to ask so this year and um, how do you find the patronage i know the day is still young this is day one but mona we are in the business of business. 
We wouldn't be here if it wasn't amazing last year. So the fact that we are here, we are title sponsors for the first time, tells you that there's so much to get from the Habitat Fair. For us, the brand itself, Love FM, Multimedia, they're pay setters, you guys are pay setters, and so are we in the mortgage business. So these two big brands have come together to help governments bridge that gap between the housing deficits, and it's our pleasure to do so. We are here because last year, like you said, when we came, we realized that we could do more with Love FM. And I'm happy to say today, yes, the weather has been good. I'm told it's been raining the entire week. Today, we've, we've, we've got this very cool weather. We've had a couple of interviews and had already have um, feedback from those interviews. We've had a lot of people come in. So definitely, I, I'm expecting even more, especially for the fact that both of our brands have just won the CIMG Awards, yes, for top class, top tier um, in the businesses that we do. So yes, come and feel that what everybody else is feeling that has given us that top tier level. Yes. Sure. Thank you very much, Leila. See you around. So that was Leila of Republic Bank. And as she's saying, you better make the wise decision of coming here because they have so many mortgage loan options for you. I move to the stand of um, Airport City, Kumasi. Let's see what Airport City has for us. I have spotted my very beautiful fine lady here that I would love to speak to. Okay. So can I interact with you? My name is Mona Lisa. What's your name? My name is Marion. Okay. Um, I've spotted Kensington Heights. What is it all about? What do you do? Because it's my first time of hearing such a thing in Kumasi, such a name. I mean, um, the Kensington Heights is a luxurious smart city. Um, it's an apartment. It's an apartment complex, part of the Airport City Kumasi project. Yes, that's the first phase. That's the key in the Kensington Heights. Yes, please. It's 11 floors with a rooftop swimming pool. But um, let me also ask, when you hear of such um, luxury apartments, most of the time it's for a certain class of people, I mean the rich ones. So if I am a middle income person, how do I afford? Um, everyone, can, everyone can own an apartment. Um, we have um, payment plans, mortgages for everyone. We have payment plans that you can spread across years. And, and buy so everyone can own an apartment yes please and what's the lowest amount of money i should have on board before so our lowest apartment is going for sixty nine thousand dollars yes please sure thank you very much and i've already seen patrons come in well what's your assessment of today's event i know this is the first time i'm seeing you on board so i know that you are recording much patronage tell me about it um, this is our first time and this is the first day. So, so far we've had people curious to know what Airport City Kumasi is about. So, so far we're going, we are doing good. Sure, thank you very much. Well, you heard um, the Kensington Heights, that's Airport City Kumasi, and they say discover the new benchmark in luxury living in Kumasi. We move on to another stand, which is safety and home solution. So when I talk about safety, then it means anything security. Let me move to my fine gentleman over here and speak to him. Uh, good afternoon, sir. My name is Mona Lisa, and what's your name? Uh, my name is Aubrey Abua. Sure, Aubrey Abua. Um, I, I, I read from your standard safety and home solutions. So it has given me a fair idea. And what do you do? Tell me about yeah, it. As safety and home solutions, we are into doors and uh, waterproofing solutions. So if you need any door from exterior door, interior doors, we have you covered. We also have doors in different sizes, depending on the door type that you want and then also we customize your door so we have our tagline as you think of a door we have it so we customize your door to any specification that you want we also have different doors like uh, waterproof weather in this one too can withstand any weather condition we have it in single we have it in double and also one and a half this as you can see is a one and a half door we have the half here and then the one here also, we have eight feet doors. This is a solid wood, eight feet door. Yes, which comes with the frame and the accessories. We do free installation, free delivery within Accra. But in Kumasi, 
We don't have a branch yet, but if you buy, we can arrange for you. Oh, sure. Thank you very much. But I would want to learn more about the customization of doors. What, what, what do you mean? Well, this is the first time I'm hearing that, so please uh, educate me. Okay, so we have the doors already made. So if you come and you said, okay, I like this door, but I want to change this handle. I want this design to be circles. I want this door to be 8 feet or 9 feet, or even smaller than this size. We do it for you. And uh, it takes only three months for you to get it fixed at your home for you for free installation and also free delivery. Oh, that's very positive. And I've also spotted, is it um, paint? Yeah, These are waterproofing solutions. They are chemicals. So if you have dampness, you have leakages, you have cracks on your wall, we have the solution for you. And also we have uh, from the roof to the concrete, we have all the solutions for you. So what's the price range, especially for the doors? What's the lowest amount of money I may have? Maybe I would want to finish my apartment with a door, but I may not have the money up front. Any package for me to pay it in installment? Yes, at the fair, we are giving up to 15% discount. But however, it depends on the type of door that you are buying and also the quantity. We can even give you as much more discount depending on the quantity you need. However, we have interior doors with different sizes and it starts from 4899 which will give you a discount of 10% which will reduce it more for you. Also, we have the complete with a frame 5299 for the exterior, uh, the interior doors. And also with the exterior doors, we have different prices depending on the size and the type you want. And there's a door which looks like a mirror. This particular yes, door looks like a, a mirror. Glass, tempered glass, uh, eight feet door. This is a single one. We have the double and then the uh, single and the one and a half. Also, we have it in the pivot door where it opens in a sideways. We have the hinge at the middle of the door. Sure. And then your waterproof solution, how much is it going for? Uh, we have it in different sizes, depending on the size that you buy. But with a small one in Sachet, we have it from 50 cities, 150 cities. And also with this one is 680 for the salt, salt um, neutralizer. For the bucket or for the, for the, bucket or for the, for the gallon? For the gallon. And uh, with the bucket, we have it in different prices. Like the integral, we have it at 2,800, and then we have the seal bond for 1,800. Sure, thank you very much, sir. And I'm sure that you are recording a lot of patronage because I've seen people uh, throwing your stand. Yes, we are doing a lot today. Though today is the first day, but we've already made about some number of sales. Okay, sure, that's very we impressive. Are also looking forward for all those in the house to come visit us. Just come and have a look, even if you are not ready. Just come and have a look. And then we have the solutions for all the issues you have in your building. That's the waterproofing solution. So Thank you. We call all to visit our stand today. We are here from now to Sunday. Yeah. Sure, thank you very much, sir. So you had uh, safety and home solutions. I also moved to the stand of Star Life Assurance and Spectra Health Mutual Insurance Scheme. Um, good morning, sir. I'm surprised to see Star Life Insurance. This is supposed to be a habitat fair, but I know that, you know, even as uh, we build our houses, there's a need to ensure, ensure, yeah. I got that correct. So, sir, tell us, Star Life um, Insurance, what packages do you have for us? Okay, we have a lot of packages. We have about six pack policies. We have the World Master Policy, the Child Life, Cash Brother Plan, our UPP Scam Plan. And let's see, that's the Home Core Policy. That's the package that we have so far as Star Life Insurance Company. Okay, so anything for homes to anything for houses, any insurance for houses? Okay, we have uh, Star Assurance. After that one, they, they, they are into uh, uh, houses, cars if you want to insure your car. But it's with the same brand? The same company, but we have to, we have the Star Life and the Star Assurance. So, so are, let's talk about yours. Yeah, so we are Star Life Insurance Company. We deal with only life. That's the how we do. 
So anything unique for patrons today at the Harvested Fair? Mm, okay. Your question again. <laughs> well, I'm talking about the products you are bringing. Anything special about it? Maybe discounted rates? I know you are in to sign people, but I want to know um, what you, you are coming here with that will attract patrons to your stand. Anything impressive? The main purpose we are here is about our spectra, the, our UPP spectra policy. That's the main reason why we are here. All those, we have a lot of policies, but you see, with our scan plan, no, you see, going to the hospital, no, yes, you may go to the hospital, the doctor may prescribe, say, go and do a scan. It's due to money. So we start life as a company, you know, as plan, say, okay, why don't you bring in a package? Even if you're on our policy and you go to hospital, with that money, no, if the, if the doctor asks you for a scan, like any scanner, at least you can have it free of charge without paying a couple. It's just an amount of money. You pay a small amount of money, you have free scan plan for yourself. Okay, so what's the amount of money that I have to have, that I have to pay to? Okay, you see, we have about six, let's say six types of scan plans. We have gold, we have the bronze. So we determine amount that we want to choose. So if you want gold, as a single person, you pay 61 CDs. If you want, if you have a family, maybe you and your mother, that is almost, yes, 120, and that, that varies as how it is. Sure. So thank you very much, Star Life Insurance, not Assurance, okay. So you had the representative of Star Life Assurance, and they say protecting you and your family's future. Now, uh, finally, let me go to the... DBS Industries Limited stand where I've spotted some beautiful ladies. Could you talk to me, please? My name is Mona Lisa. What's your name? My name is Kalyan. Okay, so please, I know you're representing DBS Industries and you have always been consistent, especially when we have the Habitat Fair. This year, what special thing do you have for patrons? Um, this year, we are actually um, having a in fact, when you come to purchase our goods or our material, we will give you a 10% discount. Okay, a 10% discount. That is a good news. And then once we have, um, once um, DBS, you know, we, uh, we will just say that we, uh, this is a chance in Papa Fear. In fact, we are selling a very good product when you talk of the uh, materials um, in the markets and those things, the open markets, we are, ours is the best. In fact, we have the best qualities. Hold on, could you please show me around some of your uh, products? Because uh, I spotted roofing sheets and I would like to have a few of them. Um, these smaller ones, uh, they are quite hard. Yes. These are the Euro tiles. Yes, these are the Euro tiles. You know, you know, with the Euro tiles, when we did the installation for Euro tiles, we have the, in fact, the wood work is diff slightly different from the ones for the long spine. Uh -huh. Those are Euro towels. This is what we call the Euro towels. Uh -huh. So this is different from the long spine. Okay, so, and, and I also heard something about it being resistant to water and all that. Yes, yes, it's correct. It's correct, yes. And let's move to the other roofing sheets that you have here. Um, wow, 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 wow. I'm impressed with what I am seeing. Well, live FM's uh, Mona Lisa Frimpong giving us the latest from the Republic Bank uh, jo uh, Love FM's uh, Habitat Fair. Uh, but of course, we'll be watching this space and bringing you some updates uh, from the Ashanti region. And that's all we have for you in this package of uh, the polls. I am blessed so that I log on to myjoyonline.com. Lots of stories there for you. Thanks for watching.